So now we're getting ready to enter the studio. Hello. Hey, welcome, hey. welcome. Come on in. Come into the studio. Hey, hi. Hi. Welcome to our studio. This is, this is where we work and, and practically live and have meetings and everything. And uh, we've been sharing a studio for 45 years. Nice. You know? We got together 45 years ago and we built a studio in Boston and we uh, shared that. We always like to be near each other, but we do paint separately and together. We've done both. So, but anyway, mostly separately. So we're going to show you some of the work on my side is over here and then Alex's side is over here. We just like to look at each other's work as it develops. So this is my... Tell me, show them what you're working on now. Okay. Yeah, this is... Um, this is a new chaos piece that I'm working on. I um, I can tell you that I go, you know, you know, everything in chaos is breaking apart in different ways, in a planned randomness array of spectral color. But there is a there is a pattern. There is a system. There are cells. There are waves. You know, and there are packets. So anyway, I'm on this color here, and you can see that the next color is, is coming up here. That's this color. But anyway, that's the way chaos develops. Starts with one color, and it ends up with 19 colors. My work is basically been devoted to a, um, you know, a trilogy of characteristics. And uh, where did I get this idea? LSD. I mean, I can't even tell you any other way. It's like we all see what we see in these psychedelic experiences, but we portray, I mean, they even see the same thing. As Alex and I always, always, always felt that we are in the same place, seeing the same thing, and yet our portrayal of it through the filters of our own experience and our own education come out as differently as ours do. And so I work in oil paint. This is oil paint on a, on a panel, on a wood panel. It's 48 inches. John, get down up close here. Thank you, John Harris. There you go. And then pan it down here. This is the, this is the, well, I'll tell you what's going on here. You've got this, this, this area, this arrow, this of, of shooting, you know, it's the, 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 um, the unstoppable object right here. And then it's going, this is the opening. It's going into an opening and there's this sort of cataclysmic thing going on here. It's based on my, my learning about Wilhelm Reich and the cosmic superimposition. So I, I include that in my composition, but I'm, I'm letting you into that secretly. Most people don't even know. Over here are some oil paintings. This is an acrylic. So I work in acrylic mm -hmm. and in oils. This is Realms of the Unpronounceable. And we'll give you a little tour of realms. It's probably my most complex puzzle. I think of uh, order as, you know, the bliss realm is order, where all things are interconnected and made of light. And uh, chaos is like the material world. There's, yeah, John's going to show you a close-up of that. That's the ultimate in order and secret writing. If you can see, there's some letters that are embedded in that, in that grid. And uh, they're flickering. It's kind of the way you see characters in the, in the altered state. You know, they're kind of flickering in, in spectral, crispy color. And then uh, chaos is up here. This is an old chaos piece. It's got much darker tones to it, but it is planned randomness where all things are breaking in, in, in many different ways. And then I call this right-hand side perfect. Perfect is where nothing is overlapping. The grid is merely like suck holes and blow holes of spectral energy, and they're all interconnecting, but they're not overlapping. In chaos, everything's overlapping. It's, it's, it's a riot of uh, chaos right there. And over here, I'll just show you, um, you know, secret writing embedded in these pools of, of, of perfect. 
Yeah. And these are two pieces that I, that I did for um, Entheon. And we'll show you uh, that we're building Entheon, a temple of visionary art. But these were uh, two pieces that will be on either side of uh, one of Alex's pieces called Theologue. Allison, those are really intricate. About how long does it take you, um, you know, to make a painting like this? Well, I think that each one of these probably took a few months, you know, maybe three months. And um, the one I'm working on now is going to be quite a bit longer. It actually takes a lot longer to do chaos than it does to do order. And I'm just going back to chaos, which I've been doing, you know, all my life. Oh, here you have uh, watercolors. So I'll show you, John. I'll just hold them up. Oh, here you go. So I also do watercolors. I do, you know, uh, these are my art church series. This is my spontaneous do whatever you want series. And I, and I keep that going too. Watercolor. I love it. And turn one, one time around, John. John's going to show you my, right there over my treadmill. There's, there's, you know, complementary mandalas. So complementary colors. I'm always using complementary colors to make the greatest contrast. So you have the yellow to purple to yellow sort of spectrum, you know, from, mid, from the middle to the, to the corners. And then across that, you have uh, the, uh, the purple to yellow to purple. So they're going through each other. This is called complementary planned randomness. So planned randomness is just as it sounds. You have to plan your randomness so it doesn't look too organized, but it has to have some order. This is a complimentary. Every, every letter is a compliment of the color outside of that letter in the box. So that's the way I roll. That's, what, that's some of my work. This is my, my piano. I practice every day. I'm learning. You can even learn at my age. <laughs> do you ever work on more than one piece at one time, or do you just focus on you know, that one painting at once? I usually am working on multiple things. I also paint pottery. You'll see that in the other room. But I, I'm usually, but right now I'm very focused on working on this chaos piece. But I, I will always go back to watercolors. It's the kind of thing that you can carry with you. You know, I have this great kit and it's just watercolor and watercolor block and a great, fabulous, juicy, fantastic, expensive brush. You know, always have the best materials with you. And if you can carry them with you, then you can do it wherever you go. You can make art everywhere you go. And I do. I, I, I never go a day without making art because art is, um, you, know, it's my, you know, it's my spiritual path. It's really my spiritual path. It's my meditation. Allison, we do have some questions in the chat about the language that you were talking about. How did that language right. speak? Okay, let me go back and say that um, <clears throat> when I was uh, very young, I started uh, experimenting with uh, psychedelics, LSD particularly, but other, all kinds of psychedelic substances. Um, and I, um, you know, did all kinds of recreation. I went to parties and I, and I, and I went bicycling with my friends. It was very, very community oriented. But when I read in 1971 Ram Dass's book, remember be here now. Uh, Ram Dass recommends going into a dark room and being quiet and going inward and seeing what happens. And I, I had enough experience with it that I didn't feel, you know, uh, like I couldn't do that. I just had never thought of doing that. Like just go inside for the whole experience. So that's when I saw secret writing. And I saw secret writing washing all over everything and through the, through the air and over my sur all surfaces. And what it means is it's the nameless, this is called realms of the unpronounceable. That means it's unpronounceable, it's untranslatable. It's the, it's my symbol that I created out of that experience uh, of the symbolic world that comes between our thoughts and the manifestations of things like art. You know, our thoughts become things through symbols and everything's a symbol. And everything that's coming out of my mouth right now is a symbol. And we agree on it, we understand it. But if you were Chinese, you might not. You know, maybe you are Chinese, but you, didn't, you, you don't understand Chinese. Anyway, I don't know. I shouldn't say things like that. I, I, 
<laughs> I'm entangled. But anyway, yes, different people, different languages use different symbols. And so anyway, um, yeah, that's where I saw the secret writing. It doesn't have a translation. It's not related to any color or sound. It is intentionally nameless, like the divine, you know, has a, a, a gazillion names. So this is the way the divine comes through, is in language and in, in, in art and, uh, and in dance and in music, you know, the spirit comes through. And so I practice that. I practice art as a spiritual thing. So. We have a few other questions. Um, yes. Um, did you have a specific experience that inspired your journey into chaos? Um, and then how do you feel while expressing chaos? How do I feel when I'm expressing chaos? Yes. That's really interesting because I don't really have anything but joy. I think the confetti and fireworks are, are chaos too, you know. There's a certain amount of order to them. They explode from one source, you know, like say, say uh, a pinata or a, or, a, or a fireworks. It comes from, and there may be a certain amount of order to it, but there's an incredible amount of freedom too, and excitement and beauty. So I don't fear chaos because it does represent the decay and, and the evolution of life too, the falling apart of all material things. There's nothing in this material world that isn't, you know, falling apart in entropy. So anyway, this is entropy and, uh, you know, um, you know, order plus entropy, it's chaos. So that's what we have and uh, yeah, I feel great. I love doing chaos, I think I might do it for a long time now. I've done a lot of order, so I'm gonna go back to doing more chaos. This is a big one, it's, 40, it's four feet square. And uh, you know, I'm, I, may, I may say I'm, I'm less than, a, well, maybe a third through it. It's got a lot, oh, see all that white space? You won't see that. <laughs> but it always has white lines between everything. Because that's the white light coming through. Coming through the cells, coming through the, the material things. You see the square is the one shape. It's a human made shape. It's very much a material world human made shape. There's very few evidences of squ actual squares in nature. Um, although I, I a lobster eye broken down to the microscopic is a grid, which is what I, what I do, but mostly no square. So I, I did that because I, I work with the material. I'm working in the material world and that acknowledges that. So anyway, that's, that's my work. And these are a few of the acrylic pieces. I did most of these on stage with musicians because we used to go all around. Here, John, let me show this one. I like this one, it's called Drift. But anyway, we went to uh, perform live painting on stage in hundreds of venues all over the world. And uh, in front of, you know, tens and tens of thousands of people, we would paint. Why they wanted to watch us paint, that is something I can't answer you. But I always had to come up with things that were acrylic because, and I didn't paint in acrylic. Oh, these show, these show, you just show my babies. This is, you know, here you've got your chaos over here, and then your order, and then your secret writing. It's my little trilogy. Yeah. Beautiful. All right. Well, if you want to ask more questions, do. Otherwise, we'll wander on over here to Alex's side. You ready? But I just think, did you see this wonderful comment from Christina Morris? She says, my six-year-old was watching with me, that's watching you, Allison, until yes. I started typing, and she said, quote, her art is so beautiful and amazing, I really understand her secret language. Why is it a secret? So maybe you need a six-year-old to tell you, you know, I like that. It's completely transparent, that's what it is. It can mean anything you want it to mean. We also got uh, an audience you. question for both of you. How often do you take LSD? Uh, rarely. Rarely. Rarely, but I, I wouldn't say never. I would say rarely because we do it with, a, with an incredible amount of uh, respect and, and, and the specialness that the experience is. It's a sacred, awesome, uh, potentially terrifying and life-changing 
uh, adventure. So it's not undertaken lightly, you know, unless it's microdosing, in which case uh, no, no one knows, uh, you know, and you don't even know yourself that you've taken a 10 micrograms, you know, because uh, that's like, uh, it's, it's uh, not psychoactive, but supposedly it uh, stimulates the brain. And it helps people with depression. That's the other thing, you know, the people that are feeling really low and have a really hard time picking themselves up are trying this sort of almost invisible, almost homeopathic uh, dose, which seems to help. So who knows? Anyway, it's it's a beautiful thing. Anybody tells you any different, I don't know. You know, at Johns Hopkins there, uh, right, right there, there in Baltimore, the yeah. Psychedelic Center uh, is uh, formed just recently around Roland Griffith's work and uh, William Richards has been a actually the mystical experience and this is why uh, we're familiar with them they've both been here to uh, cause and, and uh, speak to us uh, about the mystical experience which is the uh, when someone has been traumatized you know like they they study a lot of uh, patient populations like the veterans who have PTSD or rape victims and things like that. And so they found that psychedelic therapy can be a real help in uh, people who've had untre untreatable kind of PTSD situations. And so uh, since it's powerful psychological uh, medicine, and uh, it, uh, they found that the, the one thing that is the most healing experience with psychedelics is if a person can have a mystical experience. Now, this is a kind of full-on contact uh, with a spiritual uh, source that you kind of become one with. Uh, classically, that's what the mystic encounters is uh, unity with uh, the outer world, uh, and you see the sacredness of the and the beautiful kind of you become a nature mystic instantly and and feel the connectedness with every living thing and all the creatures and then you go within and you feel the infinite uh cosmos it's equally infinite inside of you and so uh, uh this like awesome uh reveal and a sense of uh relating to a uh a sacred and cosmic uh, force that uh, transcends the physical uh, dimension gives people, even who are suffering uh, the end of life uh, kind of uh, anxiety, you know, because they're near uh, death uh, after cancer and things like that. So they've been being treated with psilocybin. And uh, if they can have a mystical experience, you know, they will heal. So anyway, on to my painting here. Uh, and this is a painting that I've been working on for some time. It's called The Great Turn. And it's, uh, I've been working on it for several months already. It's pretty big. It's about 10 feet high. And uh, you can see that uh, there's kind of a tunnel of eyes that this, uh, Wow. two-sided person is going through and uh, they're having a kind of a mystical experience on one side and on the other side they're completely falling to the pits and uh, and coming apart and so there's this sense of of how do you make the great turn toward the light when you seem to be falling into the darkness at the same time. And so this kind of feeling of, of uh, polarity and uh, tension in a way, uh, and the positive, uh, you know, willful urge uh, to go toward the light 
and go toward the higher, better uh, uh, path of life and sacredness. Uh, it's like the great turn that we're all uh, trying to make. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's got several more months to go on it. And uh, like there'll be veins all over the figure. And, uh, the shadow of the uh, painting with the eyes here uh, has, has been hit in a way that this blue uh, area has not been hit yet, see? And so I'm gonna be scumbling. It kind of stopped here. You can see where the shadow stops here. It's going to continue up through there, so that'll separate the the web uh, a little bit from the tunnel of eyes. Um, okay. I'm sure any of the other people. Any other studio? Live and Alex's self portraits for a second. Oh, we did I have one question. Um, yeah. Alex, do you do a smaller version of your paintings before you move on to the to the uh -huh. large? Mm -hmm. yeah. There we go. Yeah, that was the uh, study. Oh, hey, uh, this is kind of interesting. Nobody's really seen this. I did it. I do, you know, little self portraits when I, you know, have an hour left at the end of the night. And I was just thinking, like, this was before the pandemic kind of hit America, but already this threshold figure uh, of Anubis is kind of showing up. Uh, it's and it was that funny mirror day, uh, the uh, o two o two two o two o. That's when Alex had his cataract surgery. I was showing this from the one. We share paint. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See the resemblance? <laughs> you. Yeah. yeah. Um, Alex, how do you create such perfect symmetry in your paintings? You uh, 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 let's see. Um, uh, tracing paper. Whoa. A ruler. <laughs> you, <laughs> A you, ruler. You do one side and flop it, you know, if you need that, you know. But on this, uh, I did drawings for, you know, actually a couple of months before I went on to the painting. Come on into the studio two. two. Yeah. This is studio two, where we have a prayer wheel made by, uh, you know, Alex, designed by Alex and made by a lot of people, a lot of artists. But here we go, I'm gonna turn the prayer wheel for you. Alex is gonna tell you what it says. On the prayer wheel it says, Sustain the web of life. Uh, may peace prevail on earth. May all beings be liberated. And may the elements be purified. So uh, when you do this, it's got, not only the Tibetan uh, Omani Padme Hong uh, kind of symbolism that's on uh, this top rung here, but it's also got uh, a lot of other symbols of different uh, world wisdom traditions because we thought it should be a world prayer wheel. And, uh, and it's kind of, gonna be an entheon. Yeah. It's what everybody's gonna get to uh, turn as they enter. You know, when they come past the desk, they can turn the prayer wheel because a prayer wheel is supposedly, if you turn the prayer wheel, it's as if you're saying those prayers. So everybody's turning it is everybody saying those prayers. And it supposedly has a, a cycle of, of sort of divinity that, that it draws down into itself, into, the, into whatever. So this is going to be in the, in the front room. And, at the end, and it was made before we had this place. We started building this Chapel of Sacred Mirrors in 1985 when we made the frames for the Sacred Mirrors. There were you know, quite a few Sacred Mirrors already, but not all of them, in 1985. And we built the frames for the new museum show and sculpted them in our basement, these 10-foot 
10 and a half foot frames. But this was made like sometime between 2004, 2009 in the city when we were looking for a place to build a temple. So that's been our, our co-project since 1985. You know, yeah. We were doing performances together before that, but our co, our co uh, artwork uh, was this temple that we're building here. So we'll sit down in front of it and answer more questions. Is there one more thing I wanted to show you? Oh yeah, we'll, we'll do that. Do we want to go through these paintings first? Hey, you want to talk about your paintings? Talk okay, about yeah, sure. Um, let's see. Well, uh, here's, a, here's a painting. Uh, <laughs> we were talking about LSD in the other room. So here's the molecule itself uh, laid out like a subway map. And uh, you can also see, oh, hey, here's Rowan Griffiths from the Johns Hopkins <laughs> Psilocybin Studies. And uh, so here, it was based on earlier research that was done on 420, 1962 by Walter Pankey. And he was a divinity student and also a, a, you know, a medical doctor. He was a student of Timothy Leary. And Timothy Leary was not thrown out of Harvard yet, and uh, it was 1962. So Walter Pankey there, he did the original mystical experience uh, research with psilocybin in 1962, which was replicated very powerfully by Roland Griffiths. So uh, Dr. Hoffman is the man who discovered LSD uh, back on what they say at bicycle day. Now here's a bicycle, his, his tie there, the man on a bicycle. That's him on bicycle day, which was uh, 419, 1943. Now uh, he had the first LSD experience and he, you know, he basically he thought he was, uh, had poisoned himself. And uh, uh, it was during wartime and he wanted to go from his lab to his home so he could die at home. And uh, so he wrote, had to ride uh, through the streets of Basel on his bicycle. Uh, that was the only way he could get home. And uh, so he, he, he had taken the tiniest dose, something that was just millionths of a gram. Now, million, that's micrograms, okay? So uh, he, had, he had 250 micrograms, and that's a substantial trip. So, uh, at any rate, it catalyzed a consciousness revolution, really. And uh, nothing had, was that uh, powerful. And it, it initiated a whole uh, study of neuroscience and stuff. And, uh, and it kind of brought the study of psychedelics back to the West. Uh, it's something that really had existed in religion from the dawn of civilization. Both East and Western civilization are psychedelic. And they had a, a key psychedelic that put, pe put people in touch with the gods. We just re uh, recently found that in uh, an ancient, ancient uh, temple in, uh, in Jer Jerusalem or something, they uh, found that cannabis was being used uh, in uh, Jewish ceremonies at that time too. So psychedelics have a long history with uh, world religion. And uh, so now they're back, uh, but mostly through science. But the artists have a special interest uh, in it as well. And that's one of the reasons that we're trying to do Entheon, uh, which will be a, basically a sanctuary for this kind of art. We started a church because uh, it seemed like that was the most uh, kind of proper response uh, to this dimension of awareness, you know, and. Uh, the divine universe we find ourselves in. Uh, here's a, uh, a cosmic elf. Now, you know, when you're, when you're tripping, uh, you might meet this guy. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> he's kind of fun, but he's a little tricky. Um, so uh, but we should go back to this earlier study to show you that here's Socrates. Now, uh, as a key philosopher in the foundation of Western philosophy, uh, and uh, it was Plato that talked about uh, Socrates all the time. 
they were all initiates into the Eleusinian mysteries. And uh, these were like a week long or so rites uh, where they took the kaikion, which was a psychedelic from back in Greece. And it was the Persephone and Demeter uh, kind of religion. And they were the goddesses that bestowed agriculture on humanity. And uh, so Hoffman was really interested in the foundations of civilization and psychedelics. Can you talk to us more about the temple that you're working yes, on? Yes, here we are. And Alex is holding the doors. This is a replica, a 12 inch plaque really that we, that some of our donors get uh, for funding and this, this wonderful temple. And these are the two doors, they're right there. And they're coming, they're eight foot uh, doors that will be on the front of Entheon. It's a relief sculpture that Alex uh, designed and created and we created uh, in bronze. So it's coming, and then this is... It's heavy. It's, it's really been an engineering, heavy. you know, Nightmare. problem. Yes. But at any rate, it's going to... It's now in New Jersey being engineered, and it's going to be on the, the front of uh, the uh, chapel, or the uh, because, Antion. Because the doors have to open with five pounds of pressure for ADA compliance. As I you say that know. I, I had to say that for Rebecca's, you know... Uh, Benefit because I you know that that has to be like, people have to be able to get in and out of that door and It's it's going to be like open like a breeze. It's going to be amazing. It's about it's about 700 800 pounds So here we are we're looking we're looking at the corner. Yeah. Our angels and There's each of these angels are facing the four directions So they're the kind of angels of the four directions and uh, you've got the multi kind of faced God all over Antheon. It's just like the many faces of the one uh, divine presence. And then up at the top, it's uh, kind of the steeple head where uh, it's the uh, people of the four directions coming together in visionary oneness. And we have the steeple head. And we have the, the two soul birds, the two soul birds that will be guardians are nine feet tall. And the steeple head is nine feet tall. And uh, there's one, we have models. I mean, this is the way we, we, we visioned it into being. We got a lot of people that said love Cosm to want to have one of those uh, images on their altar. And before you know it, we had the steeple head uh, and it was, and it was, this is, uh, and it came to us through Burning Man. We, we stopped in Burning Man and, and, and put it up there, and then we brought it here. And it's, it's a wonderful thing. Can so we haven't opened what will, yet. What will go in the temple? What's, what's happening inside the temple? What's happening inside the temple? So as, uh, as soon as you uh, go through the vestibule, which is uh, already we're working on a granite floor for the uh, opening of the vestibule, Kind of a transformative portal that, that you know that's a little that be a little bit interesting and, and, and uh, like an installation uh, of a portal, small installation as you go in mm -hmm. to the main room where it's called the All One Gallery, the Gallery of the Visionary Artists. So that's our one annually rotating show. The annually rotating thing we definitely got from Rebecca. I think that's such a good idea, you guys. I and hope now we'll be able to afford. I, we may know. have to go to a year and a half. I'm sure. You know what I'm saying? But we do have a, a an opening show uh, on the first floor, uh, and there's a there's an Antheon shop there, and there's a psychedelic reliquary there where this painting is on long loan, um, so that we can exhibit it there, and um, there is also a an information room where you can watch videos and things like that. In the, in the all one gallery, there's also like a 16 foot projection wall for moving image art that will, will be ongoing. And, uh, and so then you go to the second floor and you enter uh, the chaos order and secret writing zone, which is a few little galleries and installations uh, on the way from the earliest work I did when I was first with Alex, I sort of started there because my work unfolds from there really and uh, to more contemporary. And then it goes into Alex's first uh, room, which is the Progress of the Soul Gallery. Yep, and so there's a lot of the family uh, kinds of pieces that were in the uh, parenthood 
uh, exhibition. That's right. And uh, so uh, some of those pieces will be there. We're super grateful. You've got the, uh, uh, you know, praying and kissing and copulating and uh, the pregnancy and birth, birth and so. then holy family. And uh, so a We're number so of, uh, and uh, I think Bex is loaning us dying. So dying will be uh, back in the mix as well. It kind of presents the birth to death and uh, love uh, element of the family and the journey of the soul. And then you uh, go into an area that shows uh, a bit more about the performance art that brought Allison and I together and that is also connected with this whole um, conceptual art piece of doing a, a religious uh, kind of orientation. We, we call ourselves an art church, basically, you know. And, but uh, we call this work, <laughs> and we call our work social sculpture. I, mean, I think both of us feel that we're both painters and social sculptors. We create an environment of art that uh, inspires transformation. That's what our, our goal, our intention is, is to focus and make art that can be a catalyst for uh, social transformation. So that's been our goal all through our life. We met in a class about performance, conceptual, and mixed media. And I think this we're still doing that, although we both also were always painters and uh, love painting. Painting is really, been an attractor. It's been a lot of people come to the work through Alex's art and even through mine. And uh, so, yeah, it's been an it's been an attractor for the spiritual uh, group. You know, spiritual in life. You know, come to to here whether or not they've done psychedelics. You know, there are a lot of people who love it because it's just so radically welcoming and inclusive. You know, it doesn't. I mean, it's about acceptance. That's the core value, really. Love. Is love. Yeah. We had a few other questions coming in. Um, question for Alex. Did you study the human figure? Did you study anatomy? Do you use models? Um, any, or from memory? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. All of the above. All of the above. Absolutely. You should show, do a little pan of, of these guys, oh, John. Oh, here's, I was showing oh. the, uh, the anatomy. And then also Alex's bronze. Yeah. Uh, now, I didn't do those, but I did do that other one, the, the skeleton and the... Uh, uh, yeah. So that's one I did. Um, you know, Alex did that for his class. He taught anatomy to artists at NYU for 10 years and figure sculpture and figure uh, and painting at uh, RISD and uh, was it a Philadelphia College of Art. So Alex and I both were, were teachers and uh, Alex for a great long time until he just uh, could paint and that's it and just paint and we would love him to just paint but he's a social sculptor too. So we had to <laughs> build a whole you know community, uh, cause of being a community, a global community of people that come and did come here and hopefully will come back. The term social sculpture, as many of you might know, is uh, from Joseph Boys, uh, who's uh, a performance artist from Germany that we greatly admire. And a sculptor. Mm -hmm, exactly. Mixed media. And uh, so, but yeah, so uh, maybe there was another question. Um, we do have another, well, we had a question a while back about Tool. Somebody's wondering if you listen to Tool while you're painting. <laughs> Yes. Yes. They inspire you as you inspire them. Um, uh, absolutely. I, I love the Fear Inoculum album. And uh, people who don't know Tool uh, would not recognize the uh, painting that I have been working on because the painting uh, or studies for that painting uh, were part of the Fear Inoculum album which was released last, like August 30th, uh, at, uh, 2019. So it's been less than a year that it came out. It came out, it was released number one uh, and 
uh, it's, it's been a, a historic and Grammy winning uh, album for them. And I very fortunately got to uh, play a part in uh, working on the art uh, with them. Again, this will be the third album. I am so honored to work with the uh, artists of Tool. Uh, I respect them as some of the uh, most hardworking and, uh, and just great artists, you know, and friends uh, at this point. Uh, they've been also great friends to our organization, and and they uh, they've included by including my work that brings a whole audience of tool into uh, supporting this effort to create a sanctuary of visionary art. So uh, we can't thank them enough, and and I love listening to tool. That's great. Yeah. Um, just a little time check. We have about ten minutes left. So if there's any last minute questions from the audience. Can we see any more art that's in your studio? That's in the second studio? Yes, let's see now. Do you also have uh, Interbeing and uh, and Barda Being? Barda Being. Yeah, let's walk around a little let's bit. Let's see. Now, this is uh, some people might recognize the MAPS logo. This is something that's a work in progress, but I wanted to make a, uh, a MAPS is the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. And uh, it's uh, an organization that helps uh, psychedelic scientists and uh, stuff uh, get grants and things. So I anyway, I'd still like to working show on something that. as well. Can yeah. I show something now too? You bet. Would that be all right? I just wanted to say that this is the one of the earliest uh, examples of secret writing done in 1975. 1975, when Alex and I started uh, living together in Boston, I sat under a, a skylight and did about 10 of these and they're, they're, the letters are very, very tiny and I, I, it's very sort of a manic exercise, but all the letters are unique and they're hand drawn. And then I wanted to show them. Yeah. This is one of the, oh, I guess this is like maybe the 80s, large sheets of watercolor paper and, uh, you know, highly saturated spectrums of, uh, of watercolor. So I've been, you know, my work is always different, but it's always the same. And, 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 and uh, basically the, the inner guide, the divine told me that that's what I should do. And uh, to be committed is part of the palpable art medium that I use uh, in my work is to be committed to this range for a lifetime. That's it. You want to go in here? Come on in. We'll show you Zena's room. Come on. Rebecca mentioned Zena. We'll show you the room. She doesn't live here by any means. No way. But this we call the Zena's room. This is this is Zena when she was very little, eighteen months old. Zena. She's a Scorpio, and her middle name is Lotus. So there you go. I'm just blowing her up right now. She won't like it, but I did it. This is the Tibetan syllable Ah. Uh and it means primordial perfection. I was studying these uh, Buddhist teachings at the time, and I, you know, all children emanate that kind of divine sparkle. Baby Buddha. And this is, and this is uh, the family. Mm -hmm. This is us praying together. This is the way we pray over our meals, or any other time we're trying to get a prayer in. Yeah. Sometimes you need a prayer. I love these I Catholic portraits. So good. Yeah, I had a, a kind of a vision one time when we were praying like that. And it just kind of flashed. So anyway, I'm going to show you Zena's art. Yeah, this is. Should we show that one or should we go out in the hall? That one. That's it. That's it. That's a Zena. It's a photograph that she cut into uh, lace. Can you see her wings? You see her wings? She's flying. She's flying away from us. She's flying away from New York where she's standing on top of the roof of Cosm in the city. And she's about to fly. Come on out in the hall. I'll show you this. Where is it? Where's the light? Is it? Yeah. Oh, there she is. These are, her these are really her teenage and early 20 works. They're old. But she would cut these photographs out and, you know, and make them, uh, you know, I love them. 
We're probably going to put some of them in the show. Very dear. So we'd love to ask just one more question. I think anything, should... anything. Um, this is a good one. How do you deal with your inner critic? Um, you know that critic, your criticizing thoughts that interfere with your painting. How do you deal with that? Both of you. Your inner critic. <laughs> yeah, you want to say something? Um, I try to take careful notes. You know, and uh, write down. Uh, some of the stuff it says, and uh, and basically say, duly noted. I just want to say that creative discontent is the force that that catalyzes uh, an artist forward into evolution of their work. So creative discontent. If you're unhappy with your work. You know, make a note of what it is that you like about that piece, what it is you do not like about that piece, what it is, what would the piece be if you started it all over again and did it differently but the same piece? You know, so you ask yourself those three questions and you have, uh, you know, kind of a, a, a teaching that can catalyze you forward into your next piece. Like, in my next piece, I want to learn more about the figure I have to be able to draw the hand better, and I'm going to use references. And the next piece, I'm going to make it larger or smaller, or I'm going to do it as a sculpture. Whatever changes, you know, every piece informs the next piece, and that's your inner voice that you should be listening for, not the critic. Just know that you, that there's a, you know the next the next step, yeah, the next piece. Right. Well, you, you know, like. Uh, you want to be able to listen to your own sensitive uh, critic about stuff, but you don't want it to stop you. So uh, it's it's kind of, uh, that's why I say it's duly noted and, uh, you, and I'll see if uh, I can work on that or something. I mean, yeah, everybody's going to have emotional times when you just feel like, you know, especially these days, you know, uh, when, when there's such upheaval. The thing is, is like, we also see at the same time, you know, like, as just like the painting I was working on, it seems like things are falling apart, but they're also like making a great turn towards something, you know, like amazing, you know, unbelievable. You know, could it be that we could, uh, imagine and create a world of equality, a world where love prevailed and won, you know, a world where we could uh, step back from the, the brink of disaster and, uh, and creativity is part of what is going to keep people excited about waking up, you know, and the experience of beauty, not only in nature, but uh, in art, you know, is something that inspires people to, uh, you know, feel beautiful. You know, we, I, I think human beings need beauty, you know. It's essential. It's essential. Food of life. Um, great to end on. And I think, Rebecca, did you want to say some closing remarks? Um, can you, oh, okay. yeah. yeah. I just want to ask both of you because, um, uh, I ask this of all of our artists, and I want you to go back to when you were little children, you know, but what is the single most beautiful thing you ever, ever saw that stays with you and nurtures, nurtures you? <laughs> no, I mean, I think, I think for me, and I don't, I mean, you have to return that favor at all but I feel that when you have someone who you love who you're devoted to for life it's the view it's the view every day it's the view across the table it's the view next to your bed it's the view across from the big old bathtub it's the view and you might as well just love it and enjoy the passing changes that go over that view and just love it every day and I can't think of anything I Love looking at more than you. Oh, that is the I sweetest thing. And I, 
But I feel like that's it's like darshan. Yeah. Darshan, it's like seeing the beloved, but that's like also God. Because I met God and you in a kind of like very close <laughs> vibratory space. That's right. That's right. And uh, we came together, God brought them. That's right. It's the fabric of the universe is made out of love. And so uh, that's no wonder, you know. But the the most beautiful side then would be the side of the beloved. Uh, it's, it's the it's the physical of the divine. It's the physical embodiment of the divine. Alex, yes. to me, is the source. He's the sun. He's the physical of the divine. He's like you know he represents that for me in my life because he's always a good mirror. He'll always let me know when I'm not at my best, you know, and he'll also be just so incredibly supportive and, and 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 we're both in transformation all the time too i mean we're always you know in in change and getting better we all we know that we both of us want to be better people and well, that's the thing that you know is is at the heart of a really a good relationship is going to be better that's right and i the thing that we got to experience and that i think is behind the sacred mirrors <laughs> is the mystical experience that we both had of the Universal Mind Lattice back on June 3rd, uh, 1976. Uh, and yeah, so mm -hmm. 40, 45 or uh, 40, yeah, years ago. At any rate, that was the one where we, it seemed like stepped outside of the physical dimension and into the timeless and uh, we had become basically an energy ball of light and love interconnected with an infinite network of other balls of light in a universal mind class and changed so, our work changed our work changed the focus of our work from the self to the divine yeah so but anyway that's the most beautiful thing is the divine really it's more than any physical person is the experience of god contact and there isn't really anything greater than that it's really true i agree with you there too but uh, we uh, we in the physical are a reflection of that right. and because we both got to experience that which is unbelievable uh we uh, carry that forward and that is kind of like the one of the blessings that the, the sacred mirrors wrap themselves around. I definitely were influenced by and that experience. We, and we have gotten multiple other people saying they have had precisely the same experience. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> we love you. Anyone have questions? No, we're here for you. But uh, I don't want to, you know, overstay either. Well, thank you both so much. This has been such a treat for our audience and your audience. Um, yeah, we wish you both so well, and we hope to see you in person soon when we get the museum up and running. Yeah, and we're going to do a tour of Entheon when Entheon is ready to give a tour. Mm -hmm. You'll be among the first. We can't wait. It would be so wonderful to give you a tour. Yeah. When I, Entheon opens. It's kind of like still in construction inside, but it's going to be 12,000 square feet, three floors with an elevator. It's like, you know, we really did this. It took us a long time to get there. And, uh, you know, Rebecca knows how that is, but she, she was speedy, though. She's amazing. We think of the world of her, and she is surely one of our great mentors. Absolutely. Rebecca uh, Hoffberger is just one of, the, one of our greatest inspirations on her, and what she's brought to uh, Baltimore. Is My hometown. I love the Baltimore, you know. It's an extraordinary oh. gift to humanity, and uh, it makes... Uh, it, you know, gives a special astral shine to that area. Of, <laughs> we'll always of be back in our hearts. We're, we're always with you in Baltimore. I love it. Thank you so, so much, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us on our studio tour with Alex and Allison Gray. Um, and again, stay tuned to our newsletter for more experiences coming up. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Hey.